Uh, I'm there we go. I am Allison Marcioni. I am the programs director of the Upper Valley Land Trust. I want to thank all of you for attending the 24th annual Upper Valley Conservation Commission gathering. Yay. Um, two years ago, we held our commission gathering in person right before everything shut down, and I could not have imagined where we would be now. Uh, last year, we spent our time on Zoom together, looking back over the adaptations that we all went through over the past year. And now, um, two years in, here we are still on Zoom. Um, I hope the next time I see you all, uh, we can gather together in person to resume the tradition of eating together and talking before the presentation. I would really love it if people would put in the chat what town uh, they're from and representing tonight so that we can kind of see where everyone is Zooming in from. Uh, tonight, we have a really interesting presentation for you. Um, before we get started, I do want to let everyone know that this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel after tonight. I'll send out a link to everyone who received an invitation and you can feel free to share that video with whoever um, you would like. So tonight, I am, I am excited to welcome you to tonight's presentation, Trails for People and Wildlife. Today we have Jim Oler. Jim is a wildlife biologist from the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. He leads a team of wildlife professionals who can serve and improve habitats for the state's wildlife on public and private lands and ensures access to those lands so that the public can enjoy our wildlife resources. In his free time, you can commonly find Jim somewhere on a trail in New Hampshire, Vermont, or northern Massachusetts, hiking, mountain biking, or cross-country skiing with family and friends. Uh, so welcome, Jim. Uh, just a couple of other housekeeping things before we get started. I'm going to ask everyone to stay on mute for the presentation so we don't have any disruptive noises or feedback. Um, if you have any questions, which I hope that you will, please either type them into the chat box or raise your hand during the questions portion of the uh, presentation using the raise hands feature, which is in Zoom under reactions at the bottom of your screens. Um, oh, when the presentation is over, we'll go through the type questions and I'll ask them to Jim or I will call in anyone who has raised their hands. Hope that was all clear. Uh, so without that, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Jim. Speaker, can you hear me? I can hear you. Well, this is very odd. My uh, earbuds just decided to just conk out here. But if you can hear, hold on one second. How's that? Sounds great. Better. Excellent. All right. Sorry about that. And thanks for having me, everybody. Um, so, you know, uh, there have been surveys throughout the years that try to gauge why people own and manage land and wildlife and habitat conservation is often at the top of those reasons. Uh, but also among those reasons is, is recreation. Uh, but those two goals can conflict with each other. Uh, and, but, but we need to, people to get outside and, and enjoy nature and reap the benefits of nature. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure that's some of your goals, and it's certainly the goal of the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. If my slides will forward, very interesting. There we go. Uh, we want folks to get out and enjoy nature as well. Our tagline is connecting you to life outdoors. Uh, but so how can we get people to uh, get, get outside, enjoy nature, reap the benefits of, of nature, appreciate what we do, uh, and uh, still allow wildlife to thrive? And that's really the premise behind the tool, uh, Trails for People and Wildlife. But before we get into that tool, let's start from the beginning and talk about, uh, provide some background on what the impacts of trails on wildlife can be. Uh, the first impact is physiological. If a uh, wildlife sees or hear you coming down a trail, it can lead to having that uh, animal uh, have a change in its uh, heart rate, temperature, or stress hormones. And by itself, this is probably not gonna have a significant, significant negative impact on that animal but combined with other stressors like a, a harsh winter or a drought uh, re, uh, leading to reduced uh, food resources, it could have an impact. Another type of impact could be behavioral. Uh, our presence there in the woods could lead to changes in foraging uh, behavior, vigilance, or fleeing from perceived predators, and those perceived predators would be us. Uh, 
and for instance, you know, changing their foraging behavior, if we keep on flushing uh, wildlife off of their feeding grounds, uh, that's certainly going to impact their ability to, uh, to, to have good physical fitness. Another impact would be on the reproductive success, uh, leading to a reduction in the number of nests built, eggs laid, or young born and successfully raised. And there have been uh, a few different studies to show that. specializes in Could you mute, please? This will help you to sleep better. I mean, that, that would be, it'd be money well spent. Did you get that, Allison? I think everyone is muted now. Please remain on mute. <laughs> OK. Thanks. So there have been a, a few different studies that show that songbirds will not uh, lay nests or, or some species of songbirds uh, stay away from putting nests near trails. And if you got uh, a conservation property that has a high density of trails, you're probably gonna have fewer songbirds uh, nesting on that property. And that would lead to uh, a reduction in the local population. And given that species do often uh, migrate southward, it could actually impact global populations. And then uh, predation, uh, scaring an adult away leaves young vulnerable to predation and adults may be preyed on directly. So you can sort of picture this if you're uh, on a trail and there is a bird happens to be trying to nest nearby and you're fleeing that bird off of its, uh, off of its eggs, it leaves that, those eggs vulnerable to predation. And uh, if you're walking through a patch of shrubland habitat, for instance, and a, a, a cottontail or, or a songbird is, is uh, scared off, well, you're gonna leave that individual susceptible to uh, pr uh, predation potentially. So these impacts were, were highlighted very well or summarized very well in this paper, effects of recreation on animals revealed as widespread through global uh, systematic review. Know, you know, that achieved a new rank. You know, that's Jim, you're on mute. Okay, how's that? Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, so this was uh, published in the journal uh, Plus One in 2016, and uh, this, these authors reviewed 274 papers that looked at uh, impacts of recreation on wildlife. Uh, these papers were from research conducted primarily in North America and Europe, and it addressed all different types of wildlife, uh, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, what have you. And so this is a good summary chart and I'll take you through it. Uh, so these are all the different types of recreation that were reviewed. And so they reviewed nine papers that addressed recreational impacts on wildlife uh, from Nordic skiing and snowshoeing. Uh, those nine papers produced 27 results. Uh, of those results, uh, about over 50% so showed significant negative impacts on wildlife. Uh, snowmobiling, six papers reported on 13 results. 75% of those results were significantly negative impacts. Uh, hiking and running, 112 papers producing 792 results, uh, some around 45% significant negative impacts. Uh, dog walking, 22 uh, papers, 170 results, uh, again, somewhere around 45% significant negative impacts. You can see the, the yellow is positive impacts. Very few showed positive impacts. Some of those impacts were things like uh, increased number of starlings or, or pigeons. And then you had several that were unclear. So uh, perhaps the, the amount of vocalization of songbirds changed. Well, you don't know if that's a positive or negative impact. Uh, but basically the take home message uh, here is that regardless of what type of recreational activity you're engaged in outside, regardless of where you're doing it, you're likely having some sort of an impact on wildlife. And uh, this is a more, more recent review, uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife re, uh, requested the assistance of a, a UVM graduate student, Meredith Naughton, uh, to review uh, impacts of uh, trails on wildlife, focus more on New England. And, um, and her, her summary uh, was very similar to what I just mentioned. Uh, she also has found that in her review that Recreation has negative impact on wildlife. It, it's very clear. And uh, she recommended that there be some trail-free areas. 
uh, to allow some, provide some undisturbed habitat so that wildlife can thrive and avoid high value wildlife resources. And these are a couple of concepts that we uh, convey also in the Trails for People and Wildlife tool. Uh, the greatest effects of recreation uh, seem to occur during the breeding season, which, which makes a lot of sense. And uh, interestingly enough, non-motorized recreation, so uh, walking, hiking, uh, cross-country skiing, has a stronger effect than motorized recreation, because uh, I think they perceive people out, out of their vehicles as uh, a greater predator than uh, if you're in your vehicle. So here are a couple of real world examples. Uh, some researchers, researchers in Ontario looked at the abundance and uh, relative abundance and diversity of songbirds using conservation lands with varying degrees of trail densities. And on those properties where there were trails, they certainly found songbirds, but the abundance and diversity was significantly less than those properties that had trail, that were relatively trail free or had few trails on them. So the more trails you have, the, the, the lower the diversity and abundance of songbirds you're likely gonna have on a particular property. Another real world example in Connecticut, researchers did the long-term monitoring of a wood turtle population. And it was a very healthy population for many, many years. And then uh, trails were introduced on this complex of conservation lands that they did the research on. And that population started to decline and it kept on gradually declining and declining until that population blinked out altogether. And uh, after eliminating a variety of factors, uh, they came to the conclusion that the introduction of those trails on that complex of conservation lands led to the demise of that wood turtle population. Uh, you know, wood turtles, uh, all turtles, they're long-lived species. They are poor reproducers. Um, even though they might produce a lot of eggs, often they get predated. Uh, and uh, people like turtles. Uh, Turtles, actually, there's a big worldwide trade for turtles. They, they bring big money uh, on the black market, and so people will collect them. Plus, they're kind of cute. People like to take them home. So uh, long-lived, poor reproducers, you take a few individuals out of that population occasionally, you're going to have a, a negative impact uh, on that turtle population. And wildlife can see and hear you coming for quite a distance off trail. And that's what we refer to as the corridor of influence. And that uh, corridor influence varies with the type of wildlife that we're talking about. And we reviewed 67 articles uh, in New, New England based or as close to New England as possible to try to generate some generalized uh, corridor of influences for birds, mammals, uh, amphibians and reptiles collectively known as herps. And we found that in general, uh, birds and herps will flee within 60 feet of disturbance. Although from personal, uh, personal experience, I can tell you that sometimes birds will flee uh, at much greater distances. Uh, birds will become alert within 100 feet, 50 feet of disturbance and mammals alert within 400 feet of disturbance. So that's quite a, quite a distance. And if you look at that, compared to a, the length of a football field, it's one and a third football field lengths. So if you ever has stood on a football field and looked up and down, you can you know that's quite a distance. It's quite significant. And so let's look at the uh, trail and road impacts. This is the town of Durham, and the green polygons are the conservation lands in the town of Durham, and the, the red lines uh, on that first slide are uh, the official trails, trails that are authorized and uh, maintained by the landowners or volunteers. Add to that the, the rogue trails in yellow, rogue trails meaning those that were just created by recreational users without uh, permission or authorization of the landowners, which unfortunately happens quite often here in New England. And they add to that uh, roads, municipal roads and state highways in the corridor of influence 400 feet for mammals, you can see that there's relatively a low amount of undisturbed habitat available to wildlife in the town of Durham. The biggest uh, undisturbed patch is less than a square mile or less than 640 acres. And I don't think this is, uh, would look much different if you looked at a, any number of towns in New Hampshire. Uh, in Hollis, where I live, if we did that analysis, I suspect it looked very similar. 
I was looking at the trails in Hanover today, and I, I guarantee it'd be look very similar in the town of Hanover, city of Concord, uh, any number of places in, in uh, New Hampshire, you're going to find that based on uh, what we found in the literature and the density of roads and trails, that there's going to be relatively little undisturbed habitat remaining in New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we fragment our, our lands in New Hampshire with, uh, or anywhere with, with development, residential, commercial, agriculture, roads. We need these things to survive for sure. Uh, and uh, we also are fragmenting our conserved lands. The red lines here, uh, we fragment our conserved served lands with trails. And so you gotta ask yourself, how much undisturbed habitat is there gonna be so that New Hampshire's wildlife can thrive? And it's, and it's not, when I say the word wildlife, I'm not just thinking about those species that uh, many of us can relate to that we see uh, that are used to our presence. Uh, deer, in many instances, coyotes, cardinals, robins. Uh, there are over 400 species that call New Hampshire home. A lot of them will be impacted uh, by our trail-based recreation. And so that's where the Trails for People and Wildlife tool come in. It's a try to create a balance, uh, provide opportunities for folks to get outside and enjoy nature while allowing wildlife to thrive. So let's talk about that tool. So we developed uh, this tool based on five principles. Root trails away from wet areas, root trails along habitat edges, avoid known locations of rare species, avoid steep slopes, and avoid special habitat types. We'll go through each one. So locate trails along habitat edges. We know uh, the junction or where fields and forests meet or forest and wetland meet, whatever the edge might be. We know edges are important, uh, wildlife habitat features, but we thought it'd be comparatively better to have a trail route uh, be rooted along an edge rather than through the middle of a deer wintering area, for instance, or through the middle of a grassland field that's providing habitat for bob lynx and savannah sparrows, or through the middle of a shrubland habitat patch that provide uh, habitat for stated endangered New England cottontails or a variety of shrubland songbirds whose populations have been declining. So better to be along the edge than through the middle of a patch. And the same sort of holds true for forested uh, settings as well. And uh, the more trails you have in a forested setting, the more fragmented it's gonna be for things like oven birds here nesting that are ground nesters. And going back to that Ontario uh, example, any number of songbirds are being impacted by high densities of trails in forested settings. Avoid special habitat areas. Uh, so for this, we mapped out the, uh, we used the map habitats for the uh, special habitats identified in the New Hampshire Wildlife Action Plan. The pine barrens, uh, which have a, a lot of important habitat for rare lepidopterans and songbirds, uh, shrublands, again, New England cottontails, are a variety of shrubland birds who, whose populations have been declining. Gravel pits provide uh, good habitat for turtle nesting. Uh, wetlands and aquatic areas that are important for fur bearers and waterfowl and wetland birds. Rocky ridges and talus slopes are important for eastern small footed bats and uh, bobcats and peregrine falcons. Exemplary natural communities, these are really uh, premium examples of different vegetative communities that are important for a variety of wildlife and then avoid very poorly drained soils, which you don't want to put trails through anyways uh, from a road erosion standpoint and trail maintenance standpoint, but they're also a good proxy for wetland areas. Avoid known locations of rare species. And for this, we use the data from the New Hampshire Natural Heritage uh, Rare Species uh, Database. And we added to that uh, great blue heron rookeries that were known and cliffs with current and historic peregrine nests. And then avoid, uh, avoid riparian areas, root trails away from wet areas. Uh, these are natural travel corridors for a variety of wildlife. We know that uh, herbs and uh, birds will flee within 60 feet of disturbance. Uh, and of course, these guys would be trying to utilize that wetland patch. And I know, again, from personal experience that some birds, I, I mean, I, I have flushed up wood ducks walking along a, a wetland that, uh, and yeah, I was much further than 60 feet away from those wood ducks. So uh, 
you're going to impact wildlife along you trying to use those wetlands and you're going to impact wildlife that are trying to utilize those wetland edges as travel corridors. And avoid steep slopes. These uh, are areas like, again, peregrine falcons, bob, uh, bobcats, and small footed bats would use. And uh, of course, steep slopes are not great for building trails on any, anyways from uh, an ease of use right, and from an erosion standpoint. So we created a uh, GIS uh, data layer or a map representing each of these principles. So habitat edges, sensitive habitats, rare species, repairing areas and slopes. And we sandwich those all together to create a habitat heat map. And that's the result for the town of Durham. So uh, the red areas are the uh, sensitive habitat areas based on this analysis. The blue areas are the less sensitive areas. And the concept would be to route your trails, ideally, as much in the blue as possible, the less, uh, the less sensitive areas. And this model was reviewed by a variety of trail and wildlife experts. You can see the list here. And, um, and uh, the, the creation of this model actually was supported uh, in part by the New Hampshire Audubon, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Great Bay Estuarine Research Reserve, and, and New Hampshire Fish and Game. So where can we find this tool? So check out wildnh.com slash trails. There you're gonna find a web page dedicated to this tool. You can download a guidebook, a pretty easy, relatively short guidebook that really takes you, to, takes you through to how to use this tool from A to Z. Uh, we also have a case study here from the Har Harvey's Canard Hill Forest in Epping, a property uh, owned by the Harveys with an easement held by Fish and Game and Southeast Land Trust. And I'll be taking you through that case study here in just a minute. Uh, you can also find a recorded session uh, of this presentation uh, that I gave uh, through UNH Cooperative Extension. So wildnh.com slash trails. You can actually find the model on the Granite website if you are uh, GIS capable. Uh, you can go to granite.unh.edu and uh, search for trails for people in wildlife and download uh, the data layer to use in your own G uh, GIS desktop application. If you don't have uh, GIS available to you, you can go to an online version of GIS called Granite View, graniteview.unh.edu. Uh, and this is an online GIS application that has a plethora of data, not just the trails for people and wildlife data, but any you know, political boundaries, uh, parcels, uh, wetlands, uh, um, conservation lands, all sorts of data available here for you guys to, to explore. And the trails for people and wildlife data layer is under the wildlife heading. So you'd have to click on the, you have to click on this button here to expand the drop down menu to find out what's under the wildlife uh, header. And you'll see the wildlife action plan and trails for people and wildlife. So we'll click on this, click on wildlife, and the habitat heat map will show up. And uh, the, the parcels are also, so uh, property boundaries are also available. It's the, it's the digital tax maps that have been compiled by the Department of Rever Revenue Administration. And uh, so, uh, Hopefully, if, you, if your town has that data uh, that was passed on the DRA, it'll be included in that parcel data layer, and you can overlay the parcels and look at your particular property that you are interested in evaluating. Uh, alternative, alternative to that is you can actually draw your property boundary. It'll be an approximation, but it'll certainly be uh, useful to even have an approximation of your property boundary drawn on here. So how to use the tool? Let's talk about that. So the first step is mapping the existing features on the property, uh, your access points, your roads, your existing trails, your parking areas, uh, the ecology that might be missing from this uh, habitat heat map. You know, wetlands do change over time and the wetlands data that we have available on a statewide basis is a bit out of date. So it'd be good if you have some uh, local knowledge of the wetlands that occur on your property. Uh, just make sure that that is well represented uh, in the in the tool. 
Uh, vernal pools, we don't have any good statewide data for vernal pools. So that's really uh, requires you to, to know your property and know where those vernal pools are located. And then rare plants. Uh, so there might be, uh, again, locations of rare plants that NHB is not aware of that you may know, know about. And then uh, map out your destinations. Where do you want to get people to? Uh, you know, the viewpoints, maybe it's a, a overlook for a wetland, uh, historic features, um, other viewscapes, um, you know, high elevation areas that give a good view. So where do you want to, want, want to get people to? So here's just a sample, a demonstration map of a, a sample property. So all of the, you know, the parking areas are mapped. Uh, the ecology that uh, may not be represented on the habitat heat map are maps of rare plants, vernal pools, uh, some potential destination points, a cellar hole, a scenic vista. Uh, so the concept is stay in the blue whenever possible. Uh, that is the best route to minimize impacts to wildlife and still people get outside to enjoy nature. So you can see here, it's, it is going along this riparian area, but a quite a distance away from the riparian area. So minimizing the impacts on those uh, travel corridors for wildlife, uh, staying in the blue to get to the scenic vista rather than going along this riparian area. It's staying in the blue crossing the, these streams rather than going perpendicular to them or parallel to them to get to the orchard and then back and still leaving some areas undisturbed. So you're having this whole area undisturbed for wildlife and this whole area undisturbed for wildlife. So uh, staying in the blue wherever possible, getting to the destination points without impacting your ecology or minimizing impacts on ecology of the property. And then once you looked at your trail design or trail layout on the habitat heat map, you're gonna have to consider the corridor of influence. And so uh, buffer those trails uh, with the corridor of influence to see what sort of impacts you're going to have on the property. Here's a sample property, 4.6 miles of trails, uh, and these are influencing 267 acres or 68% of the entire property. Uh, the largest uninfluenced area is 38 acres. So that's quite a lot. That's quite a lot of impact on this property. But if you take away these, these two dead end trails that go to nowhere, you're, you're increasing the amount of undisturbed habitat significantly, two and a half times actually, uh, uh, to going from 38 acres to 93 acres of undisturbed habitat. So look at your trail design on the habitat heat map, make some tweaks there, then overlay the corridor of influence and see how much uh, habitat is influenced uh, by that corridor influence and see if some tweaks are needed to try and create a better balance between recreational opportunity and undisturbed wildlife habitat. So here's that case study, the Canard, for, uh, Canard Forest, Canard Hill Forest. So this is a 1100 acre property in the town of Epping. Uh, it is owned by the Harveys with a conservation easement co-held by the Southeast Land Trust of New Hampshire and Fish and Game. Uh, this property has 137 acres of wetlands, uh, farm fields, and, and forested habitats. Uh, a lot of species of greatest conservation need call this home or could. And uh, you can see the existing woods, roads, and trails that were on that property, 13 miles. And uh, so the Southeast Land Trust uh, hired a, a consultant, a recreation consultant, to map out all the trails, map out uh, the important ecology on the property, the destinations, uh, the viewscapes, uh, and the problem spots on those trails. So places with a lot of mud, uh, places with stream crossings that may be in poor condition, places that were impacted by ATVs, et cetera. And based on all of this information that was collected, they put together uh, what they felt was a good balance between recreation opportunity and wildlife habitat, which is also a goal of the easement uh, for this property. <clears throat> so you have the existing trail system. Uh, they overlaid the corridor of influence and this is what they found. So uh, with the 400 foot mammal uh, corridor of influence, 863 acres of this 1100 acre property was impacted or disturbed. That's 76% of the property, quite high uh, percentage. 
Uh, for birds, about 38% of the property was disturbed, and for herps, uh, about 187 acres, or 16%. So what does this uh, system look like on the habitat heat map? Uh, you can see that there's a lot of moderate to high impacts. Uh, the, the, the trails that they decided to decommission are in this dotted purple. And the trails that they decided to retain are in green, but you can see the ones they decommissioned, uh, a lot of impacts here along this wetland edge, a good amount of impacts here. Basically, this trail system sort of went around the entire perimeter of this wetland system, so high impacts for that wetland system. So they, did, they decided to decommission portions of it, but still provide opportunities for people to enjoy it right here. And uh, there was very little undisturbed habitat, and so they decided to decommission this these trails here to oh, to make this big chunk undisturbed from a wildlife standpoint. They decided to decommission this dead end trail, uh, also making a bigger patch of undisturbed habitat. And so, yeah, so they decommissioned high habitat value areas, uh, trails that led to dead ends, steep trails, which makes a lot of sense, and trails with a lot of, with multiple problem spots. So that was their sort of the principles they, they decided to follow, which were good ideas. And so you can see what sort of, uh, how much undisturbed habitat there now is with this new trail layout. So 46% uh, of the property is, uh, is disturbed from a wildlife standpoint. That's a 34% reduction but still providing a lot of opportunity for folks to get out and enjoy this property. So that's a good balance in my book. And they're getting folks out to, to the different viewpoints. So uh, here's a rock outcrop. Here are some wildlife openings um, and some proposed wildlife openings. So future wildlife openings. Uh, let's see, there's a cellar hole somewhere around there. There you go. Uh, another viewpoint here, a scenic view along this wetland. So folks are still able to, to view the wetlands in different areas to enjoy the, those wetland systems, but the trail is not going around the entire perimeter of the wetland. Um, and um, they're not going around the entire perimeter of these wildlife openings as well. Some of the wildlife openings are going to be left undisturbed. Uh, some chunks of forest and some wetlands are going to be left undisturbed. So again, a good balance providing opportunities for folks to get outside and enjoy this property while leaving some areas uh, for wildlife. So once you have looked at your, your trail layout uh, on paper, it's really important to get out in the field. Uh, hopefully you've done a lot of field assessments even before you decide to uh, lay out your trail. But once you do decide on a trail layout, it's good to go and double check especially this time of year. This is really the best time of year to go check. It's the wettest time of year. You're gonna see where all the problem spots are. You're gonna be able to see where the vernal pools are uh, that aren't well represented in the habitat heat map. So it's really important to get boots on the ground, to know your property even before you start planning, but after you lay out the trail uh, on paper to go out and double check it, see if you've missed anything. So in summary, the concept here is to, to map the existing features of the property, your access points, your ecology, your viewpoints, apply the trail uh, location tool, uh, look at and follow the blue. So lay out your trails by following the blue as much as possible. Uh, if you're creating a new trail system, you're planning your best route based on the concept of following the blue. Uh, if you're looking at existing trail system, you're, you're just determining should you maintain uh, the existing trail system? Should you reroute sections or decommission some sections altogether? Then overlay the corridor of influence and see if you need to make some additional tweaks and then go out and field verify. It's not only important to look at uh, the impacts of uh, trails on wildlife from a property perspective, but also from a community perspective. Uh, a lot of conservation commissions own various parcels of land in your town or a land trust would own a lot of different properties within their focus area. And so it's a good idea to, uh, to look at your, your complex of properties. And maybe there are some that would 
uh, really be suited to high densities of trails. Uh, maybe they have fewer sensitive resources. Uh, and uh, those are, could be considered ambassador to lands, properties you really want to, to really uh, develop a, uh, a good trail system uh, and uh, advertise that trail system, get folks out there on the property to enjoy it. Other properties may have a lot of sensitive resources. Maybe those would have few or no trails. And then there are going to be some in between, right? A moderate density of trails, perhaps. And so that's what uh, that additional inset here is just trying to convey. High dense, uh, you know, uh, properties with uh, high value wildlife features, maybe few or no trails, those that are mostly blue. Um, high density trails that people can get out and really enjoy. The other thing to consider though is also what resources you have. Uh, so uh, really it, from our perspective, our goal should be a targeted network of frequently used trails uh, that allow land managers to focus your available resources. And those resources are the number of volunteers you have, the time that they have, the funding you have, the equipment, infrastructure, uh, really, are the trail systems that you folks have on your towns, are they sustainable? Can you actually maintain them? If not, uh, perhaps you should uh, consider looking at the Trails for People and Wildlife tool, seeing where you can make some changes to develop a balance between providing opportunities to, for folks to get outside or leaving some areas free uh, for wildlife to, to thrive. Getting your project off of the ground, where can you get help and advice? So there are a lot of good resources here in New Hampshire. Uh, this is one of them, Best Management Practices for New Hampshire Trail Construction and Maintenance, uh, developed by the Trails Bureau, uh, the New Hampshire Trails Bureau. And uh, here's where you can find it, nhstateparks.org slash about us slash trails. This in partnership with the Trails for People and Wildlife Manual, uh, really it gives you, I think, most of what you need, most of the resources you need to really uh, plan out your trail system and maintain it well. The UNH Cooperative Extension County Foresters are also available to help not only with uh, trail issues, but also wildlife and forest management issues and other stewardship issues. They are a great resource. If you've never uh, connected with your county forester, I really urge you to do so. Uh, you can just Google UNH Cooperative Extension County Forester and you'll find, them, uh, find the one for your area. Nature Groupie, uh, naturegroupie.org. This is the clearinghouse for outdoor volunteer opportunities in New England. Hopefully you guys all know about it. Uh, if not, you should check it out. They have a lot of trail maintenance resources uh, on this website as well, but you can also post opportunities for uh, volunteers to come out and help you with your trail projects or other conservation land stewardship projects. And I uh, want to, uh, uh, I want to acknowledge the other folks who have worked with me on this project. Uh, Katie Callahan is Fishing Games GIS Manager, and she was really instrumental in putting together this tool. Uh, and Rachel Stevens with the Great Bay Estuarine Research Reserve, and I uh, provide the inspiration and doing a lot of the outreach for this tool. So really, the idea here is to provide opportunities for folks to get out, enjoy nature, have fun, uh, reap the benefits of being out in nature, but also allowing wildlife to, to do their thing and have healthy populations. So with that, I can answer any questions you folks have. All I right. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Jim, that was great. Um, we have a few questions in the chat, which I'm gonna um, read through first and people can continue to type questions in or raise their hand if they'd like to speak. Um, so the first question is just asking for a reference to the um, not in 2021 study uh, that you referenced in the beginning. I don't know if, if that's something you can, if they're looking for the paper, a link to the paper maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I can just email it to you, Allison, and you can disperse it to folks. Absolutely. Um, the second question here is from Sarah. She, she says the number of yellow rogue trails seems to overlap directly with the official paths in the first image. Is that the case? That's the first first image that you showed of the trails? Oh, the, the Durham uh, instance, uh, the, the yellow lines may have overlapped a little bit. Well, we should double check that, but there are certainly a lot of road trails in the town of Durham and many other places. Uh, we've got them here in the town forest in Hollis. I mapped them. Uh, so any number of places uh, 
you know, I'm sure you got them in, in various places in the upper Valley as well. Mm -hmm. So. Um, will Vermont be incorporating something similar, which might overlay with the Vermont conservation design map? You know. uh, they've been considering it. Vermont Fish and Wildlife has been considering it. I'd uh, suggest you reach out to John Austin at uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife and see where they are in the process there. Awesome. Uh, Sarah Riley, looks like you have uh, your hand up. You're on mute, though. There we go. Um, here's a... Um, a real life question. If you have a vernal pool that happens to be really near a trailhead, um, from, from looking at the information in the tool, it seems like a 60 foot distance is a sort of, is, would you say that's the minimum distance to keep a trail away? Would it be better to keep a trail completely away? You know, I'm trying to figure out yeah. how it's far away is far enough away. Yeah, at least 60 feet, generally speaking, you might want to have a trail that goes to the edge of one vernal pool so that people can understand what vernal pools are and look for eggs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I, I think the biggest thing is, is you don't want them going to every vernal pool or maybe half of your vernal pools. And then I think the biggest factor there is dogs uh, love to go in uh, and I mean, our dog does it too, to be totally honest, but so that you don't want to impact every vernal pool. Uh, ideally, you know, keep your dogs out of the vernal pools to keep the uh, eggs from being dislodged and impacted. So a, um, a, a dog on leash sort of campaign for the, you know, that spring, uh, yes. that yep. spring season would be appropriate? That would be okay. appropriate, yep. And actually on fish and game lands, we uh, have a rule of dogs on leash from May 15th to July 15th specifically for that reason or for the, breed, for the breeding season am, am, amphibians in particular or uh, all wildlife you know that that time yeah. period is is important and based on the research we know that the breeding season is perhaps the most impactful from a recreate you know people recreation standpoint so yeah. dogs on leash during the breeding season is a, is a good idea great Great, great question. Uh, we have a couple more chatted in questions. So <clears throat> Gary wants to know, could a vernal pool layer become a reality with the help of citizen scientists? Uh, say that again, please. Could a vernal pool layer become a reality with the help of citizen scientists? That'd be really cool. Uh, on a statewide basis, we don't have a way to manage that, unfortunately. Uh, I think that would be a, a pretty concerted effort required to uh, organize and catalog all that data. It's something that Fish and Game has thought about for quite some time, but we've never had the resources to put to it. Um, all right, Jody would like to know, is there a quick educational flyer that commissions could share with community members to give out at town meetings as a, at an educational table about this information? Uh, we have uh, little business cards and because of COVID, we haven't been able to do this presentation live very much. But we have these little business cards with the, the trails and for people and wildlife logo and our website and the habitat heat map on it. We could certainly provide copies of that to you guys uh, if you're interested. Uh, that's about the only thing we have currently. Uh, there is the case study, the Canard Hill Forest case study, which is I think two pages on the Trails for People and Wildlife website. That also might be an opportunity. Great, those sound like good resources. Um, Sarah says, thanks, Jim, for all this info. Will the presentation be made available? Yes, Sarah, I will have it up on our YouTube and I'll send that link out when it's available. So this can be shared. And there's also, Jim has done other webinars as well that um, can also be shared. Um, I see, Sarah, do you have another question? See your hands back up? Yeah, <laughs> you're on mute though. <laughs> so you're, yep, you're muted. <laughs> I do have another question, but I'll defer if there are other hands up. Uh, go ahead. Um, another not quite hypothetical is if you have a property that um, doesn't have an official trail network and has existing old paths on it, um, and most of it's most of it shows up as blue uh, on the tool on Granite View, um, then would you really just go by what ground truthing gives you um, because there's on the ground you can definitely see wet areas and is it just should that really be the driving factor what we see on the ground when the tool 
doesn't give us a lot of distinction in coloration? Yeah, uh, always what you find on the ground is more important than the tool. Well, the tool is a guide that will okay. never replace uh, stuff that you guys know about on the ground on that property. So, um, you know, you can add, you can overlay that local knowledge onto that tool, which will hopefully, which will provide even more information to help you make your decision on where those trails should be or which trail should be de de decommissioned or not. But it sounds like that property might be a good ambassador property, right? One of those properties where, where you have a good trail system, you advertise it, come, please come here and enjoy yourself. Maybe there's other properties that you guys manage that have a more sensitive habitats where you don't have as many trails or no trails at all. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Anyone want to raise their hand or put something in the chat? No? <laughs> Um, all right. Well, if anyone has any last minute questions, please um, ask them. Otherwise, I will say um, UVLT does use this tool um, in. Oh, John has a question. Fantastic. <laughs> At least I think John has a question. I'm getting there. Ah, I'm getting there. There we go. There we go. <laughs> hey, um, thanks very much. I just wanted to um, I'm going to post in the chat um, the Hartford Conservation Commission put together a a little eight and a half by 11 poster that basically um, talks a little bit about um, amphibians and vernal pools. And it basically says, uh, um, you're close enough. Um, you're welcome to use it, um, credit or not, whatever. So I'm gonna, I'll post that in the chat. Thanks, John, that's great. Yeah. Thanks, um, Jim, thank you very much. This is the second time I've heard you present this. The first time was at a New England SAF meeting. Oh yeah. Uh, maybe a decade ago. No, no, probably only no, four no, years no. ago, but it was, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. You bet. Great. Uh, Jim McCracken has a question. Um, this is thinking sort of as the environmental educator part of this and, and uh, do any of the studies talk or look at just the involvement of getting people out on the land and the value of that, um, of the recreation and the love of getting volunteers and such. Um, and I don't know how you compare it to the impact on wildlife and such, but I... Um, well, there's, there's no doubt that getting people out in nature is important. And, and we know, we all know that. And there have been many studies that have looked at that as well. Uh, but we're taking it from the lens of how do we create a balance? You know, we, I, from, from my standpoint, all of our conservation land should not have high densities of trails and we don't need them to, right? We can still provide right. plenty of opportunity for folks to get out and reap the benefits of nature, but still allow wildlife to, to do their thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, I know this will be a <laughs> conversation in our <laughs> conservation uh, yeah. meeting. Um, anyone else or I'll say what I was going to say then, uh, <laughs> UVLT. Oh, there's another question. Jody. Hi there. Um, thanks very much, Jim. It's uh, great to hear you talk on this topic. Um, I'm representing Cornish uh, Conservation Commission tonight and, um, we're redoing our natural resources inventory this year. And one of, the, one of the sections has to do with recreational opportunities. And I think this has been uh, really an educational and instructive in, in how we um, need to, in, in this 10-year uh, version, uh, to be sensitive to the impact of, I mean, we've wanted, you know, really worked hard to get people out into property, onto properties and enjoying uh, nature and the out of doors, but, you know, we don't want things loved to death. And so, um, you know, trying to strike a balance um, and finding the words, I think a lot of your information will, will be helpful. And um, so, so I really appreciate it. It's very timely uh, for us. So thanks very much. You bet. Awesome. This is a great time for me to say UVLT uses this tool <laughs> to plan our trails. 
And our Vice President of Stewardship, Jason Brard, is planning on doing a follow-up presentation about how we use the tool um, for our own properties. So keep your eyes and ears open about that uh, coming soon. Uh, maybe it'll be helpful for those of you planning new trails or just trying to get a, an idea of how a local group is using it, or if you have questions about some of our trails and how we decided to put them where we did, that's coming soon. All right. And uh, we would like to uh, put, put together some more case studies to share on our website. So if you think you have a property that would make a good case study, uh, you can go ahead and, uh, and, and email me. You know, if we, if we get like 25 of them, you know, I'm, I won't have the time to review them all, what have you. But, you know, I, I doubt that'll happen. But go ahead and email them to me and uh, we'll take a look. And if it uh, looks like a good example, we'll use it. Fantastic. All right, any last questions from the audience? Sarah Riley, <laughs> she's back. <laughs> Hi, yeah, sorry, it's like a bad meal. Um, <laughs> so one last question about when you have a, a trail that's mostly through blue, but, but needs to or does for whatever reason, cross a yellow to orange, which is often a drainage, you know, a perennial or a seasonal stream. Um, is, you know, the, is the motivation to avoid that area primarily because of the, the impact to the wildlife? And, and can that be mitigated by having, say, bog bridges or some kind of a boardwalk? Or does that not, um minimize the impact to wildlife well if you're if you're crossing that drainage it's way way better than going all along the drainage so that's sure. that's a, a good alternative and uh and as long as you're using the um the trail bnps from the new hampshire trails bureau on how to appropriately cross those drainages it, it should be fine i'm not too worried about crossing a drainage uh but i'm more worried about going right along it great Thank you. All right. Anyone else? <laughs> all right, hearing none. Thank you, Jim, for joining us tonight. And thank you, all of you who came to listen. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, and hopefully next year, we won't have to be on the computer. <laughs> Very good. Thanks for having me, folks. Yeah.